This week on Wealth Track, tackling the fear of outliving your savings in retirement. Morningstar's Christine Benz and Wells Fargo's Frederick Axeter provide perspective and solutions. Next on Consuelo Mac Wealth Track. Funding provided by Clearbridge Investments, a Leg Mason company, Thornburg Investment Management, Active Management, Flexible Perspective, Ku and Patricia Ewan through the Ewan Foundation, committed to bridging cultural differences, and the Fairholm Foundation. Hello and welcome to this edition of Wealth Track. I'm Consuelo Mack. How concerned are you about having enough money in retirement? How about actually running out of money? In a Wells Fargo annual retirement survey of 21 to 72 year olds, seven in 10 workers said they were concerned about running out of money. 69% don't know what they would do if they did run out. 38% of workers say it would be a financial hardship to live past the age of 85, yet 42% expect they could do so. Among the generations, Gen Xers, those born between 1961 and 1981, exhibited high stress. With at least a decade left in their careers, 55% describe themselves as struggling or suffering in their financial lives. And less than half say they are saving enough for retirement. What about the much younger millennials, roughly defined as those born between 1981 and 1996? 60% say they are struggling or suffering financially, although they have much more time to make up the difference. A common theme among all these generations, 92% feel more secure about retirement if they have access to a 401k, and across all generations they feel considerably more secure, have less stress and more savings if they have a clear financial plan, what Wells Fargo refers to as a planning mindset. No matter what the age, the greatest fear is running out of money, especially if they live longer than expected. We have two retirement experts with us to provide some perspective and solutions to these concerns. Christine Benz is the Director of Personal Finance at Morningstar and has been a WealthTrack guest since the beginning. During her 25-year career at Morningstar, she has helped millions of investors through her columns and books to tackle some of the biggest challenges that can make or break a financial plan. Frederick Axeter is Executive Vice President and Head of Strategic Business Segments for Wells Fargo Asset Management. His responsibilities include defined contribution and ESG, environmental, social, and governance investing. He has devoted much of his career working with companies to improve their employees' financial plans and financial health by increasing the participation and outcomes in 401k plans. How justified is the widespread fear of running out of money after the age of 85? That's where we started our discussion. It is a realistic fear. And, and uh, as you're saying, about 70% of people are saying that this is our greatest fear of running out of money in retirement mm-hmm. uh, from a financial standpoint. And, and, um, and 38% say that if they live past 85, it would represent financial hardship. Right. So that, that's really those what-if scenarios that I was referring to that are so important for us to try to address. Christine, you know, you're advising actually individual clients. So, I mean, is living beyond 85 a very real concern, and should it be? Well, it absolutely should be. Um, longevity has stalled a little bit in the U.S. in terms of increases in longevity. But if you're part of a married couple, there are roughly one in three odds that one of you will live to age 95. So if you're embarking on retirement at sort of the traditional 65 years old, that's a 30-year time horizon that you need to, t- to plan for and you need your portfolio to remain sustainable over that time horizon. So let's talk about some of the solutions to this. So l- let's say that, that you're, you're lucky enough and also have planned well enough that you're okay until 85. So what do you do, Frederick, um, if you live beyond 85? Well, one of the things that are coming up in this research is longevity insurance. Right. Uh, and, and so we're talking about the, the key risks that we face in retirement from a financial standpoint. You can think of there's sequencing risk, there's market risk, there's inflation risk. Longevity risk is the most important risk. Hmm. So if you can buy insurance you know, so that you get a, a monthly paycheck if you live past 85, well, we are addressing the most important issue. 
And Christine, so what, what are you recommending for as far as longevity insurance, for instance? What are the solutions that you're recommending to your Morningstar readers and audience? Well, you know, it's not a terribly liquid market yet. I think um, financial planners and advisors have a lot of interest in this area, and we mm -hmm. st are starting to see new products come online. The good news is that um, because, say, you buy a typical longevity insurance product, it doesn't start paying out until later in your life, so it's pretty affordable. That that's the nice thing so about the early, these. So should you do it early, in other words, sir? 65, I think, right. or when you are ready to be serious about embarking on retirement, I think is a reasonable time to look at a product like mm -hmm. this. And of course, you want to evaluate the insurer's wherewithal because you might have another 20 years before you begin receiving income from the product. So you want to make sure the insurer is viable. And, and how much is enough? What do you pay or how much do you pay for what kind of coverage? Yeah, so in our research, we find that if you put away about a seventh of your, of your savings at 65, mm -hmm. which I think is, is a great age that Christine mentions, then um, you should expect when you reach 85 to get roughly a 30% yield on that money. Mm -hmm. And that's even today with, with you know, still interest rates still low pretty interest low. Rates and, and so forth. So it, 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 to your point, it becomes very price competitive, very attractive, mm -hmm. just because the first payment is later on. It's really as, as, as more of a, you know, it's, it's insurance. It's right. insurance a, a, against something that hopefully is a very good thing, right. us living longer. The, the objections to that that people have from an investment point of view is, well, what if I don't live beyond 85 and then I'm going to lose that investment? Or it's money that I could be investing now for the next 15 years or 20 years. You know, how do you overcome that? Objection. Academic research certainly points to there being sort of a visceral negative reaction to permanently parting with money and maybe never getting a use from it. Um, I guess the counter argument is we all pay homeowners insurance and uh, don't necessarily need it, hope we'll never need it. Right. And I think it's helpful to adopt a similar mindset in relation to protecting against longevity. What, what are some other solutions, Christine, to if, if, you, if you are lucky enough to reach 85 and live, live beyond 85? Well, one of the obvious ones is um, if you are taking Social Security, if you can delay your benefit even a couple of years or all the way up until age 70, you can enlarge your benefit quite significantly. So that is a great thing to consider because that's a lifetime benefit, of course. And it's also valuable for spouses um, where maybe you have one younger spouse, one older spouse, if the higher earning spouse can maximize his or her benefit by delaying a little bit, that can be really powerful in terms of hedging against longevity. Another idea um, is just to make sure that the portfolio, the investment portfolio, has adequate growth potential. Because if you're hunkered down in two safe securities, cash and bonds, you have a realistic shot of not out earning inflation, let alone growing that portfolio. So even retirees need healthy equity exposure. Right, opinion. and that's something that, right, instead of getting too conservative, I'm sure that's a real danger. Absolutely. You know, I mean, retirement is, is fraught with all sorts of uncertainties. And, and one of the uncertainties, Frederick, that I, I know that you're concerned about is that, you know, when you think you're going to retire and what you're planning to retire, when you're planning to retire, is not necessarily what's going to happen. Yeah, today on, on average people retire around 60, the age 63. Uh, but what's interesting, and this comes up so clearly in, the, in our research, is that uh, when we ask retirees, they, were, they said that they're actually eight, eight times more frequently they, uh, that they ended up retiring earlier wow. than huh. they expected versus later than they expected. So I think it's just stuff happens right. uh, to us, and, and we end up retiring a bit earlier. And, and we need to have a robust enough system to help us pre prepare for those events. And so that's interesting. So you found that as well. And, and this is when you said stuff happens, this is not, it's not because they say, oh, I want to retire earlier. Right. It's because they lose their job or there's a health issue or whatever. So. So what's the solution to that, Christine, for planning for that? How do you plan for that? I think you have to plan for some flexibility around that retirement age. Um, give yourself a little bit of wiggle room so that working until you're 68 or 70 is not your only fallback plan. I think individual investors and their advisors need to give themselves a little bit of flexibility. And another important point is, um, and you mentioned it, Frederick, the idea of sequencing risk.
risk, this idea of mm -hmm. entering retirement and in, encountering really lousy market returns. Well, if you can potentially give yourself some flexibility to delay retirement or at least reduce your expenditures if that bad market environment materializes, that's another great thing you can do to help save your plan. And, and you have, a, I know, a bucket approach yes. anyhow. So just to tell us about that, how that can prevent you from withdrawing money uh, in a down market, for instance. Yeah, I think it's just an intuitive framework for thinking about how you would structure your portfolio as you embark upon retirement. So the basic idea is that you have a cash bucket that's maybe one to two years worth of portfolio withdrawals. You're battening down the hatches with that money because you don't want to risk um, jeopardizing your standard of living. And then you just step out a little bit on the risk spectrum from there. So um, maybe for the next eight or so years of retirement, you have high quality short and intermediate term bonds or bond funds, and then you hold equities. And the idea is that in a worst case scenario where you do encounter a terrible stock market environment right at the beginning of your retirement, you have enough safe stuff that you could spend through if you needed to. Right. So there are generational divides as well, Frederick, that your research showed. And that um, so 58% of boomers say that they're saving enough uh, for retirement versus 48% of Gen Xers. Now, Gen Xers are what, between the, in their 40s and 50s, so they've still got time. But why are they feeling so stressed? Well, in many ways, Gen X, um, we, 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 sometimes we talk about them as, as the sandwich generation. They were, they were right. sandwiched between two major systems. The, the, the boomers had a pension plan, a defined benefit plan, and the millennials, they are, have been automatically enrolled in defined contribution plans like a 401k. Right. Um, the Gen a, Xers are caught in between. We didn't quite, exactly. I mean, they started saving six years later than, than the, on average uh, versus the millennial oh. generation. They, um, over half of them are, are still paying, paying uh, down non-student uh, loans. Wow. Um, more than half of them uh, say that, that um, they have, they're not saving enough. Um, more than a, a, a quarter of them are also saving for their children's education. I mean, th there's uh, basically anything that came up <laughs> in our research pointed to the Generation X being a little bit more vulnerable. Right. And also, they went through the financial crisis during kind of key, you know, there are some key earning years as well. Yes. And in fact, they say they're the ones that they feel they have the greatest scars uh, mm -hmm. from the financial crisis. That was, that was another question that we specifically asked. Right. So what's the solution for the Gen Xers? Yeah, and, and, and I think we, we need to act now. Uh, right. This is, this is the time. There's urgency. Uh, first, I would say that generally and across the board, we want to get more and more people into what we call the planning mindset. And, and this is a, a combination of you know, both having a, a longer-term financial goal, a shorter-term financial goal, and also that you're taking action. And, and, and it's particularly important with the Generation X. And so for employers, um, I would say have a, an automatic enrollment into your defined contribution plan, mm -hmm. not just for new joiners, for everyone, so that it becomes easier for you to start to participate in, in a retirement plan. And, and again, particularly important for Generation X and also particularly important for women. Mm -hmm. So this, this, this planning mindset, and that's another thing that this research shows, and I'm sure, Christine, that you have found that as well, that, that people who plan number one, feel better, They're, they feel more financially secure, and in fact they are, they save more. So for the Gen Xers, what's, you know, do you have specific uh, advice? Well, I think the, the empty nest years can be a really powerful time to sort of turbocharge the retirement savings. Um, the financial planner, Michael Kitsis, did what I thought was some really hopeful research around those empty nest years. And he found that for people who had paid college expenses for their children, right. gotten that big ticket item out of the way, that if they had another good 10 years of work and heavy savings, that they could actually make up being oh, in a interesting. hole. Mm -hmm. So um, those years um, can be very uh, profitable for making up a shortfall that existed before. So saving more than you have when you probably save very little, 
uh, that's the secret. I mean, if you've got a 10-year period or whatever, that that can make a huge difference. Right. And post age 50, you're also eligible to make some of those catch-up contributions. And right. those can start to give you more critical mass. Too. Right. In your 401k, in your IRAs. And, right. and a health savings account as well, post right. age 55. Gotcha. So, Frederick, millennials, you know, of course, I look at millennials and say, ah, oh, you all are so young. But they're stressed out, too. I mean, I was just surprised that 60 percent describe themselves as struggling or suffering in their financial lives. So how worried should they be? In many ways, the millennial generation are a little bit better off, especially versus Generation X. And they've been automatically enrolled in plans. But as you mentioned both, that we have a, a real shortfall where 40% of working Americans don't have access to a retirement plan. Right. So when we're asking them, they, for, they rightfully feel that like they, they are in, in trouble or in, in a, in a yes. vulnerable state. Uh, so I think we, we need to make it easier for people to get into the planning mindset across different generations. And, and for, for millennials, I think it's about automatically enrolling them in, in, in workplace savings plan, making sure that across the board, everyone has access. So for that, those 40% that are not offered an em employer-based savings plan, what do they do? What you can do is you can you can establish an IRA. You right. Can, you can save you know post tax on your own, but again th these are are they're, they're this more cumbersome. Mm. It's so easy with a, def a defined contribution plan. It happens automatically from right. your paycheck, and 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 we need to nudge people to 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 introduce more simplicity in helping them have the retirement they want to have and deserve. Yeah, any of those nudges, I think, can be so powerful. So um, auto-enrollment, re-auto-enrollment. If someone doesn't take you up on it, auto-enroll them the right. next season. And then also, I think, a huge advance and maybe one of the reasons why the millennials um, are in somewhat better shape is just the uptake of target date funds. It's a great all-in-one mm -hmm. solution for people who have no idea what they're doing. You've got a lot of people out there on the road who have not taken any classes in driving, essentially. Right. And so the target date products, while not perfect, I think really nicely solve for uh, the fact that, that people come into 401k plans not necessarily knowing where to start. I do think that the decumulation stage right. is, is the spot that really needs some work um, I agree. in the system. That's the thing that's not working for participants Right, and, and I right know now. that worries you a great deal. It does. What worries you about the decumulation phase? And also, again, what can individuals do to make it a, you know, a work more effectively for them. Yeah, I, I think the potential uptake of some sort of longevity feature to 401k plans would be a great advance. Mm -hmm. People look at their 401k balance as a sort of an abstraction. Um, so say they have a million dollars, and um, my thought is, well, I hope you like living on $40,000 right. a year because that's a sustainable withdrawal rate from a million dollar portfolio initially. Um, so people need help in terms of understanding what is a reasonable withdrawal rate, what's a reasonable structure for my portfolio in retirement. Um, as much as I love all-in-one funds for accumulators, target date funds, my view is that many of the retirement income funds on the, pro on the market really aren't ready for prime time in terms of being all-in-one solutions mm -hmm. for retired investors. So I'd like to see more work done there in the asset management space. In the meantime, I think uh, investors can just maybe think about sort of this bucket strategy in terms of structuring their portfolios, maintain dis discrete cash, bond and stock components and use that to help inform where they go for cash on an ongoing right. and, basis. And we're in an unusual period right now in that we've had a nine year bull market. So uh, people who are looking at their retirement accounts are saying, gee, I've done really well and the stock market's been really good to me. Um, is that, you know, now we, at some point the market will correct substantially, it always does. You know, how do you, you know, what's your advice in that situation as far as our expectations? Are our expectations too optimistic at this point after a nine-year bull market? I, I think they are. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we're also seeing this kind of year over year in our survey that there's, for example, we're asking the question, are you saving enough for retirement? Right. And, and that over the last couple of years is uh, more and more people are saying yes. We don't really see the evidence of people saving more. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's uh, yeah, I think it's people are becoming more and more optimistic. Um, 
And, and I think that the ongoing communication and also um, people are looking for rules of thumb, you know, and, right. and some, some guidance of, you know, what is a normal return? What is the normal drawdown rate that you mentioned, Christine? I mean, we can provide that to, um, to investors. Uh, over optimism on the part of re potential retirees? I think so. Christine? That's a concern because um, I talk to a lot of people who are in their 50s and thinking about retirement. So I do think that um, over the next decade, my personal view is that market returns are likely to be pretty muted. Right. Um, so if you have um, maybe some sort of a, a weak equity market at the outset of your retirement, that can deal a catastrophic blow to your plan if you're overspending from the plan during those years. Right. So I think there are real risks to people who are retiring young and who aren't realistic about the potential of maybe the market not being uh, so helpful over the next decade. Uh, we, we, we ran some numbers on, on this and I, uh, we said that, that for, a, for a woman retiring at age 65 and you were drawing 5% per year using some reasonable capital market assumption you know, standard mortality table, then you have a 30% risk of running out of money. It's wow. It's because of, of greater longevity. So, by, uh, right, I mean by 85 or sooner? Um, <laughs> it's usually uh, by 85. 85, it, right. But it, it's it, it, just answering question, what 30 are the chance, chance. of, and, and if you, to, to Christine's point, if you have no market returns on the first five years, that number goes from 30% from to 50%. So, you know, having market returns early in retirement back to sequencing mm. is really important. Right. So if you don't have them, you've got to plan for that. Right. And right. also recognize the research that we have about sustainable withdrawal rates from portfolios. People who are embarking on retirement at age 50 might take the 4% guideline, which they may have heard is a sustainable withdrawal rate. Well, it's important that they understand the assumptions that underpin that 4% guideline. It's built on a 25 to 30 year time horizon. If you're retiring in your 50s, you may well have a longer time horizon than that, in which case you should take a lower initial withdrawal rate than 4%. One investment for a long-term diversified portfolio, Frederick, what should we all own some of in a long-term diversified portfolio? Last time I was here, I said target A funds, and I continue to say target A funds. And I, I would say, in, in this case, talk to your advisor, talk to your employer, but making sure that these target A funds help you also in the accumulation during your retirement. And are there target date funds that do that, that help you in the decumulation well, I, I phase? I agree with Christine that, that I think there's more to be done. Mm -hmm. I don't think that those solutions have been really put together yet. And I think that's a call to action for the industry. When I think about the must-have investment um, for investors at all life stage, I just think of a good plain vanilla equity fund, um, whether it's an index product or an ETF or some sort of a core, very low cost, actively managed fund. Um, I think that that is something that should follow someone throughout their lives, even into retirement, uh, because they do need the growth potential that comes along with equity. So exposure. a core equity fund, low cost, would, would low it cost. be would it be global or is domestic enough? Or I think a globally diver diversified portfolio makes a lot of sense. Um, and the neat thing is, is that you can buy hedged products that um, get the foreign currency fluctuations mm -hmm. out of the mix, and costs are really coming down on those products. So I like the idea of, of a globally diversified equity portfolio. Right. To follow you wherever you go, <laughs> to whatever stage of right. life. Christine Benz, thank you so much for coming thank in you, from Chris Chicago Brown. from Morningstar. And Frederick Axler, so great to see you from Wells Fargo Asset Management. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Before we share our action point with you, we want to alert you to an exclusive WealthTrack podcast we are doing with an up-and-coming next-generation portfolio manager. Bill Miller IV has been working with his famous dad for several years. We'll be talking to him exclusively on WealthTrack.com about his specialty, the compounding power of generating both income and capital appreciation. It's on our website, wealthtrack.com. Well, at the close of every wealth track, we try to give you one suggestion to help you build and protect your wealth over the long term. This week's action point is train your brain to save. 
There was a fascinating article in the Wall Street Journal recently about a Cornell University study showing that our brains may be wired to look for chances to earn money, but fail to recognize chances to save, even when they are right in front of us. The study found that every time we work, we practice earning. We don't practice saving nearly as much. As one of the study's co-authors told the journal, imagine there is a saving muscle in the brain that is not getting used very much. We can exercise that much more. As numerous other studies have shown, using as many automatic programs as possible to save is the most effective long-term strategy. The article also recommends starting a simple daily routine of putting a dollar a day into a savings account as a good beginning exercise to get into a savings pattern and mindset. Piggy banks for presents, anyone. And next week on Wealth Track, the state of the economy and markets with strategists Don Rissmiller and Nicholas Bonesack, members of Wall Street's top rated macro research team. In this week's exclusive extra feature on our website, Frederick Axeter discusses a positive trend. More companies are focusing on financial wellness among their employees. That is encouraging. For those of you active on social media, keep reaching out to us on Facebook and Twitter. Thank you for watching. Have a great weekend and make the week ahead a profitable and a productive one. Funding provided by Clearbridge Investments, a leg mason company, Thornburg Investment Management, Active Management, Flexible Perspective. Ku and Patricia Ewan through the Ewan Foundation, committed to bridging cultural differences, and the Fairholme Foundation.